what are the major explanations for the collapse of the Soviet Union? Maybe ones you agree with and ones you disagree with. Very often, people confuse three different processes that were taking place in the late 80s and early 90s. And the one was the collapse of communism as ideology. Another was the end of the Cold War. And the third one was the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, all of these processes were interrelated, interconnected. But when people provide ideology as the explanation for all of these processes, that's where I disagree. Because ideological collapse uh, happened on the territory of the Soviet Union in general. The Soviet Union lost the Cold War, whether we are talking about Moscow, Leningrad, or St. Petersburg now, or Vladivostok. But the fall of the Soviet Union is about a story in which Vladivostok and St. Petersburg ended up in one country, and Kyiv, Minsk, and Dushanbe ended in different countries. So the theories and explanations about how did that happen, for me, these are really very helpful theories for understanding the Soviet collapse. So the mobilization from below, the collapse of the center, against the background of economic collapse, against the background of ideological uh, ideological implosion. That's, that's how I look at the, at the fall of the Soviet Union, and that's how I look at the theories that explain that collapse. So it's a story of geography, ideology, economics. Which are the most important to understand of what made the collapse of the Soviet Union happen? The Soviet collapse was unique, but not more unique than collapse of any other empire. So what we really witnessed, uh, or the, the, the world witnessed back in 1991, and we continue to witness today with the Russian aggression against Ukraine, is a collapse of one of the largest world empires. We talk about, or talked about the Soviet Union, and now talk about Russia as possessing plus minus one sixth of the surface of the earth. You don't get in possession of one sixth of the earth by being a nation state. You get that sort of size as an empire. And uh, the Soviet collapse is continuation of the disintegration of the Russian Empire that uh, started back in 1917, that was arrested for some period of time by the Bolsheviks by the communist ideology, which, which was internationalist ideology, and then came back in full force in the late 80s and early 90s. So the most important story for me, this is the story of the continuing collapse of the Russian Empire and the rise of uh, not just local nationalism, but also rise of Russian nationalism that turned out to be as a destructive force for the imperial or multi multi-ethnic, multinational state, as was mm, Ukrainian nationalism or Georgian or, or mm, Estonian, for that matter. Oh, you said a lot of interesting stuff there, 1917, Bolsheviks, internationalists, how that plays with the idea of Russian empire and so on. But first, let me ask about U.S. influence on this. So one of the ideas is that, you know, through the Cold War, that mechanism, U.S. had major interest to weaken the Soviet Union, and therefore it, the collapse could be attributed to pressure and manipulation from the United States. Is there truth to that? The pressure from the United States, this is part of the Cold War. And Cold War, part of that story, but it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't explain the Soviet collapse. And uh, the reason is quite simple. The United States of America didn't want the Soviet Union to collapse and disintegrate. They didn't want that at the start of the Cold War in 1948, we now have the strategic documents. They were concerned about that, they didn't want to do that, and certainly they didn't want to do that in the year 1990-91. As late as August of 1991, the, day of coup, the, the month of the coup in Moscow, President Bush, George H.W. Bush, travels from Moscow to Kyiv and gives famous or infamous speech called Chicken Kyiv speech, basically warning Ukrainians against going for independence. Uh, 
the Soviet collapse was a huge headache for the administration in the White House for a number of reasons. They liked to work with Gorbachev. The Soviet Union was emerging as a junior partner of the United States on in the international arena. Collapse was destroying all of that. And on the top of that, there was a question of the nuclear weapons, unaccounted nuclear weapons. So the United States was doing everything humanly possible to keep the Soviet Union together in one piece until really late November of 1991, when it became clear that it was it was a loss cause and they had to say goodbye to, to Gorbachev and to the project that he, he introduced. Uh, a few months later, uh, or a year later, there was a presidential campaign, and uh, Bush was running for the second term and was looking for, for achievements. And there were many achievements. I, I, I basically treat him with great respect. Uh, but destruction of, uh, destruction of the Soviet Union was not one of those achievements. He was on the, on the other side of, the, of that divide. But the, 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 the politics, the political campaign, of course, have their own rules. And they produce and give birth to mythology, with which we, we still, at least in this country, we live till now, till today. So Gorbachev is an interesting figure in all of this. Is there a possible history where the Soviet Union did not collapse, and some of the ideas that Gorbachev had for the future of the Soviet Union came to life. Of course, history, on the one hand, there is a statement, it, it doesn't allow for what ifs. On the other hand, in my opinion, history is full of what <laughs> if. That's what history is about, and certainly, certainly there, there are yeah. scenarios how the Soviet Union would, would, would uh, continue. Uh, would continue beyond, let's say, Gorbachev's tenure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the argument has been made that the reforms that he introduced, that they were mismanaged and they could be managed differently, or there could be no reforms and there could be continuing stagnation. So that is all possible. What I think would happen one way or another is the Soviet collapse in a different form on, on, on somebody else's watch at some later period in time because we, we're dealing with not just processes that were happening in the Soviet Union, we're dealing with global processes and the 20th century turned out to be the century of the disintegration of the empires. Mm -hmm. You look at the globe, at the map of the world in 1914 and you compare it to, to the map at the end of the 20th century, 1991, 1992, and suddenly you realize that there are many candidates for being the most important event, the most important process in the 20th century. But the biggest, the biggest global thing that happened was redrawing the map of the world and producing dozens, if not hundreds, of new states. That's the outcome of the different processes of the 20th century. Look, Yugoslavia is falling apart around the same time. Czechoslovakia uh, goes through what can be called a civilized divorce, a very, very rare occurrence in, in the fall of multi, multinational states. So yeah, the writing was on the wall, whether it would happen under Gorbachev or later, whether it would happen as the result of reforms or as the result of no reforms. But I, I, I think that sooner or later that that, that that would happen. Yeah, it's very possible hundreds of years from now, the way the 20th century is written about as the century defined by the collapse of empires. You call the Soviet Union the last empire. The book is called The Last Empire. So is there something fundamental about the way the world is that means it's not conducive to the formation of empires? The meaning that I was putting in the term uh, the Soviet Union as the last empire was that that was the Soviet collapse was the collapse of the last major European empires, traditional empires, mm -hmm. that was there in the 18th century, 19th century, and through most of the 20th century. Uh, the the, the Austria-Hungary died uh, in in the midst of World War One. The Ottoman Empire disintegrated, the Brits were gone and, and left India. And there was the, the, the successor to the Russian Empire called the Soviet Union was still hanging, hanging on there. 
And then came 1991, and what we see even with today's Russia, it's it's, it's a very different, it's a very different sort of policies. The the, the uh, Russia uh, or Russian leadership tried to uh, learn a lesson from 1991. So there is no national republics uh, in the in the Russian Federation that would have more rights than uh, the the Russian administrative units. Uh, so the the structure is different. The uh, nationality policies uh, are different. The the level of Russification is much higher. So it is it is in many ways uh, already a post post imperial formation. And you write about the that moment, nineteen ninety one, the role that Ukraine played in that seems to be a very critical role. Can you describe just that? what role Ukraine played in the collapse of the Soviet Union? History is many things, but it started uh, in a very simple way of uh, making notes about, on the yearly basis, what happened this year or that. So it's about chronology. Mm -hmm. Chronology in the history of the collapse of the Soviet Union is very important. You have Ukrainian referendum on December 1st, 1991, Mm -hmm. And you have dissolution of the Soviet Union by the leaders of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus one week later. Mm -hmm. And the question is why? Uh, Ukrainian referendum is is the answer, but Ukrainians didn't didn't answer their referendum question of whether they want the Soviet Union to be dissolved or not. They answered very limited in terms of uh, its 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 been in question whether you support the decision of Verkhovna Rada, of your parliament, for Ukraine to go independent. And the rest was not was not on the ballot. Mm-hmm. So why then, one week later, the Soviet Union is gone? And uh, President Yeltsin explained to President Bush around that time the reason why, why Ukraine was so important. He said that, well, if Ukraine is gone, Russia is not interested in this uh, Soviet project because Russia would be outnumbered and outvoted by the Muslim republics. So there was there was a cultural element. Mm-hmm. But there was also another one. Ukraine happened to be the second largest Soviet republic and then post-Soviet state in terms of population, in terms of the economy, economic potential, and so on and so forth. And as Yeltsin suggested, close culturally, linguistically, and otherwise, to Russia. So with the second uh, largest republic gone, Russia didn't think that it was in Russia's interest to continue with with the Soviet Union. And around that time, Igor Gaidar, who was the chief economic advisor of Yeltsin, was telling him, well, we just don't have money anymore to support other republics. We have to focus on Russia. We have to use oil and gas money within the Russian Federation. So the, the state was bankrupt. Uh, imperial projects, at least in the context of the late 20th century, they costed money. It, it, it wasn't a, a money-making machine as it was back in the 18th or 19th century. And uh, um, the combination of all these factors led to the, to the uh, processes in which Ukraine's decision to go independent spelled the end to the Soviet Union. And if today anybody wants to restore not the Soviet Union, but some form of Russian control over the post-Soviet space, Ukraine is as important today as it was back in December of 1991. Let me ask you about Vladimir Putin's statement that the collapse of the Soviet Union is one of the great tragedies of history. To what degree does he have a point? To what degree is he wrong? His formulation was that this is the greatest, the, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe, a tragedy of the 20th century. And I specifically went to, and, and looked at the text and, and put it in, in specific time when it was happening. And it was interesting that the statement was made a few weeks before the uh, May 9 parade and, and celebrations of the, of the uh, victory. A key part of, of, of the mythology of the current of, of the current Russian state. So why say things about the uh, Soviet collapse being the, the largest geopolitical strategy and not in that particular context, the Second World War? 
Uh, my explanation, at least, is that the World War II, the price was enormous, but the Soviet Union emerged as a great victor and captured half of Europe. 1991, the 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 in terms of the of the lives lost at that point, the price was was actually very very low, but for Putin, what was important that the state was lost, and he in particular was concerned about the division of the Russian of the Russian people, which he understood back then, like he understands now, in very very broad terms. So for him, for him, the biggest tragedy is not the loss of life. The biggest uh, tragedy is the loss of the great power status or, or the unity of those whom he considered to be Russian Russian nation. So at least this is my reading. This is my understanding of what 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 is there, what is on 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 the paper, and what is between the lines. So both the unity of the sort of quote Russian Empire and the status of the superpower. That's how I read it.